How many people here are familiar with the, the story of Malala Yousafzai? Excellent. We have her parents, um, uh, Turpakai and uh, Ziaeddin uh, Yousafzai, and uh, Ziaeddin's uh, partner, uh, Jahan Zeb, who the, together they have founded the uh, Global Peace Center Canada um, with the effort of bringing peace to the world through education. So we're going to have uh, a five minute talk from them on what the Global Peace Center is all about and then a moderated discussion. Uh, if you guys have questions, we got two mics on either side. Uh, there were also, um, uh, I think we had an uh, uh, email in Dory, so if you wanna do that, but we have a small enough group that just put up your hand or ideally come, come to the mics. Uh, so without any further ado, guys, why don't you come on up and give us your background. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. So yeah, I think just five minute background on what the Global Peace Center uh, of Canada is, what your mission is, and then we'll sit down and, and have a discussion. Okay, can you give me this mic? Uh, you should have. Okay, it right will now. work. Good morning. How are you? Yeah, so, I mean, we know about Google. Everybody knows. But uh, I don't think that there is a sing <coughs> any single day in my life when I don't see Google logo on my iPad. <laughs> Not a single day. So you are a very well-known organization and well-known people, and I'm very honored and feel humbled to be amongst you. And uh, if I want to leave the stage, I can tell you that, okay, just Google Malala of Zain, leave me alone. But that will not work. This human story, to share story on human uh, uh, best. It's very important. So, my name is Yaudin Yusufzai. Uh, if you can sit, so later on I'll ask you to speak. Okay, thank you. So, my name is Yaudin Yusufzai, and uh, I'm properly and uh, uh, mostly known as Malala Yusufzai's father. And I tell people that once uh, she was my daughter, but now I'm her father. <laughs> and too much known by a daughter. Now, when people introduce me as her father, so they are a bit apologetic and tell me, do you like to be introduced like this? And I tell them that, yes, of course. I'm in a patriarchal society and in many societies we are, uh, fathers are known by their sons. I'm one of the few, hardly few, who is known by his daughter and I'm proud of it. So, I think here we talk about uh, education and peace uh, because everybody has a long story, I mean, every one of you in this room. And uh, everyone's story is worth listening. And when we share stories with each other, we learn from each other. Torpeka is here, she is my beautiful wife. Would you like to stand just that? May I see your face? And now they will say that Malala look like you, not like me. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I was born in a small village in uh, north of Pakistan. Uh, so my story will tell you how education is important in the communities which are developed and in the communities which are not developed. And the point I'm making is that Education is the only road, only tool to progress, to success, to human de development, to maintain and to, 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 to keep our human civilization. So living in a small village in the north of Pakistan, Swat, the village I was grew in, it was a small village, not with big population, but, but in that village, uh, I think less than 50% boys went to school and there was no concept of girls' education. No concept of girls' education. We were very lucky here. And I had five sisters and we were two brothers. Our parents, like my father and my mother, both of them were very, very much interested in my brothers and in my education, but they never thought of about the education of 
the five daughters, brilliant daughters, which they had in their home. I also observed discrimination in small things, like when a chicken was cooked, so the sumptuous part of the chicken uh, was given to the boys, and like Nick and poor parts of the chicken were given to the girls. We used to take uh, cream with milk in the morning with the tea, and the girls only took tea. So such kind of discrimination, it reflects the attitude and the behavior of the society towards their girls. So I was, and really, when you don't know about human rights, justice, equality, sometimes you enjoy that favoritism, which is for you. Like as a child, I might not have felt that why I'm getting uh, cream with milk and my sister's not. I might have felt, okay, good, I'm special. <laughs> but later on, when I got education and I did my graduation, I did my master, I realized that that education changed me. Education changed my inner being, inner being. And the things I was, I found in my childhood, like I was bullied by some of my cousins uh, because of my stammering. I stammer when I talk, so they bullied me. And I was also a little bit discriminated because of my dark color. Uh, fair color was more popular in the community. And I tried to wash my face with milk, uh, but it didn't work. So, what, so, so, so after getting education, I, I thought that I should not retaliate or respond bullying for bullying or hate for hate or discrimination for discrimination. My, my positive revenge was to fight against all those injustices, inequalities, and discriminations which exist in any form in the human community. So my education, I mean, the education changed my life. And uh, when I married Torpekai, uh, she could not go to school because there was a school in her uh, small village too. Uh, her father took her to school, but she was the only girl in the classroom and all the rest were boys. And in the classroom, she used to think of her cousins who used to play in the fields uh, on the rooftops. And she said, okay, I will not, let's stop it because she was missing her other cousins and peers. So she left school at very early age, but nobody asked her, where are her books? Why is she not studying? Why is she not reading in school? So that was the end of her education. But after marrying her, I realized that I married her because she was very beautiful. Later I know that she's very wise, wiser than me, very prudent, very intelligent. And then I said, I felt very sorry that had she been educated, she's still very good. But I was thinking that how many women we have lost their potentials, their energies, their contribution to the community because of not educating them. And I thought that if I'm a father, Long before marrying her, I was thinking of marriage. Every young man thinks of marriage, you know. <laughs> and I was thinking that if I marry and then I have children, I must have a daughter and I will name her Malala Yousafzai. Because Malala of Mevwand was a legendary great Afghan heroine who, 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 rose, who raised her voice against the British uh, army in Afghanistan and who encouraged the Pashtun freedom fighters to go back and fight back with bravery, who were fleeing from the battlefield, they went back and they fought and they won that bat battlefield. And Malala of Mevan, she gave her life on that battlefield. And she became, she became a legend in Pashtun Afghan history. So Malala had a name of her own because I always tell that and patriarchal and in uh, narrow uh, re 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 religious societies, women are usually known by their men. Mostly, 
even I give an example that when they take a woman to a doctor and the doctor asks, okay, what is the, the name of the patient? And they say, okay, right, uh, Mr. So-and-so's daughter, Mr. So-and-so's wife. He feels ashamed telling the name of his sister or his wife because even the name is something private. And I'll share you an interesting thing with you. Uh, in Arabic, uh, women are called masturat. You know? Masturat. Can you utter this word with me? Masturat. masturat. And masturat means the covered, the hidden, the covered. You understand? So when you call them the covered and the hidden, behind the scene, it, this very world that you give them collectively, it tells your perception and your ideology about women, freedom, and empowerment. So I thought that if I'm a father, the first thing I'll do that I will educate her very seriously. And uh, I think that uh, is I believed in education, so um, uh, I started a school in the Swat Valley. It was an independent school, and I started from a scratch from three children. We just recited the national anthem of Pakistan, started it, and in 2012, this school had 1,200 children, 500 uh, 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 girls and some 700 boys. So uh, Malala was in the same school. And uh, I realized when I was uh, op operating and running that girls' school, uh, because I came close to the girls, and I realized that how much brilliant these girls are, the way they think, how much critical they are in thinking, how much confident they are. Uh, and that's why when Taliban banned girls' education, so we had to stand. And uh, Malala wrote a BBC diary. She volunteered herself for New York Times documentary to raise her voice. And her voice was the most powerful voice for girls' education. And what happened later on, is that voice was so powerful that Taliban felt that it is becoming very popular in the country. And uh, rather than getting terrified of our violence and uh, horror, people are listening to the peaceful voice of this girl. I mean, her voice was more powerful than the suicide attacks and the bomb blast of Taliban. And they realized that she should be finished. Because when you don't have any argument, and when you, don't, uh, when you are weak in your argument, uh, and you are violent, then the only way you have is to finish your uh, opponent, or finish the person who uh, doesn't agree with you. But man proposes, God disposes. The voice which they wanted to silence on a local level, it became a global voice for every child, for every boy, for the right of education. Thank you very much. I spoke for long. Thank you. Should I? OK, much is there. OK, sorry. Uh, it happens. <laughs> so Jahan, could you? Um, uh, give us some sense of, of the Global Peace Center of Canada and where you're taking uh, Ziauddin and the, the Yusuf Sai's story and pushing it out to, to global peace, taking that global, that global voice uh, and making it one for peace. Uh, thanks, Adam, for having us. And uh, I want to thank Sabrina to bring us here. And there was lots of work done by Vera and Vern. Uh, Vern is in Raptors today somewhere. <laughs> Uh, but let me uh, officially or publicly thank, uh, welcome Ziauddin Yusufzai uh, to, to be here for the fifth or sixth time here in Canada. Yes. Uh, but above uh, and beyond, uh, Turpika is here with us and she is publicly uh, coming forward to support uh, education. Mm, and Malala and Ziauddin and peace and education everywhere in the world. So thank you very much.
uh, Turkey Tape for, for, for supporting uh, for supporting many uh, 1.5 billion young people, uh, 1.5 billion people are living in conflict affected countries right now. According to the UN estimates recently, uh, they have published this statistic. 600 million are young people which are living in conflict affected countries. In Pakistan, the country which Malala belongs to, and we envision Global Peace Center taking the Malala's vision of quality education to be given to children, to be given to young people. Uh, and that vision is of Ziauddin. And now I found that, that with the, 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 the work which Ziauddin and Malala was doing, Turpikai was standing behind them. If she was not there, I, I believe that. I just don't think, but I strongly believe that they could not have achieved what they achieved or what they are doing for us and for all of us here in, in, in Canada, in US, and, and in the world. What the Global Peace Center, I'm coming to, to your question now. Uh, Global Peace Center, uh, as I mentioned, and 600 young people are living in conflict-affected countries, 100 are in Pakistan only. So, and if we don't provide, if we don't provide those children the quality quality education, the concepts and skills of peace, what they will be doing. We don't have answers yet. We don't have answers yet, but what, what we can do together and through this uh, initial startup organization, Global Peace Center Canada started, we have a very good support at Conrad Grable College at University of Waterloo. They are taking uh, administration, they are managing our charitable status, so if you want to donate, uh, we hope that they, they can get it. Now, the Global Peace Center Canada, the aim is, or the purpose is, is to provide uh, hope and opportunity to young people to, to, to be educated, to be having the skills of peace and concept, uh, skills and concepts of peace, and to be living like all of us, like all of you. Um, and uh, the vision for this is that uh, schools, colleges, universities uh, should have the, the capacity to provide uh, th those children, those students, the education which they need, which we have usually in the West. In conflict zones, usually uh, it is not there. So I, I have a few statements which I want to, to go into. So the root, uh, through the visions of the Global Peace Center Canada, we envision that the root, the root causes of violent conflicts are identified, uh, are analyzed, and conflicts are transformed peacefully. Uh, and students, educators, and leaders have developed the concepts and skills of peace. Schools, colleges, universities, and leaders have quality education, and what that means, quality education. As Yaudin mentioned, young students and educators, everyone should have the critical, creative, democratic, generative thinking. Uh, they should have acceptance, they should accept diversity, they should accept multiculturalism, identities, pluralism. In conflict-affected countries, one major ethnicity or group dominate others, and there are questions of power. So they need young people through education. They need to question the power uh, of of this. It could be states. It could be dominant groups. So when they empower themselves, then they can live a, a peaceful and fulfilling lives. And in and, and we want to how we are going to do that to co-develop peace education curriculum, uh, working with few universities pa in Pakistan and Lahore University, Wilfrid Lahore University, uh, Waterloo University, McMaster, few, people, few professors here at uh, Mac, uh, University of Toronto. So we'll be developing, co-developing peace education curriculum and provide training to educators. We were here, we were there in Pakistan. I took uh, a delegation from U Waterloo and uh, Law University. We spent uh, a week and met with 150 
graduate students, PhD students, uh, presidents of six universities and professors of some nine universities. And what they were telling us, we need, West has developed a knowledge base in peace in, in, in the concepts of education. We need their training from you. We need your support in education. So I think they're looking forward to provide their training. They are looking forward to provide peace, edu peace, peace uh, curriculum, support in peace curriculum. And so I think with Global Peace Center, we are developing those skills and we are honored. Uh, we are very highly honored that Ziauddin is our honorary chair. And when he is coming to Canada, he came uh, f last year in June, Laurie University offered uh, a doctorate degree in law and what, he, what Ziauddin was asking, they asked that what we can do, and he, uh, he asked them, you can provide a scholarship to a young woman. So now they have provided a scholarship to a young girl from Pakistan, which hopefully will be coming in, in September. Another talk, which I think Sabrina was there at WXN, and Ziauddin went, and he received another support system and came to Global Peace Center Canada, and one young women from Nigeria, she received that scholarship and she is doing, she completed her master degree in peace and conflict studies. So what Ziauddin is doing here in the West as well as in conflict affected country, it is in, if it, it is in Syria, in Lebanon, or in Afghanistan, Pakistan. Um, we need to support him, we need to support his cause. So thank you very much for for your support, and thanks, Adam. Excellent. You're most welcome. Um, so you mentioned that a huge part of your organization's mission is to push peace education into universities and colleges and schools, but a lot of these internally, dis uh, all these people who are, are uh, fleeing conflict, they're, whether they're internally displaced or refugees, uh, they're living in conflict zones. Um, most of what we hear is, to do with peace is peace negotiations, peace summits, it's all about the political angle. What's at stake for these 600 million internally displaced people and people fleeing conflict zones if we can't get education in? Because most of what we're focused on is, is getting bandages and sutures and doctors and You don't hear a lot of talk about getting books in, about getting crayons in, about getting chemistry sets into those locations. What do we stand to lose as a society if we don't do this? You're asking me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, as Jan Zeb Khan mentioned. So you see, the, uh, in any human disaster or tragedy like violent conflicts, which we see in Syria, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, uh, in many other countries, and uh, children suffer most, and especially their education is at the receiving end. And like when militancy started in Swat Valley, uh, the, their most favorite and their most uh, uh, target was girls' education and education in general. Taliban bombed more than 400 schools only in Swat. And in this is during the Talibanization. Of that. Yes, they bombed more than 2,000 schools. So similar thing is happening in Syria. And uh, according to M M Malala Fund's uh, data, uh, 2.7 million Syrian refugees children are not in school. So 2 million are internally displaced in Syria, and 0.7 million are migrated to the neighboring countries like Jordan and Lebanon, and these children are without school. Why their edu education is important? Because generally when global leaders, they come together, or this discussion goes on about uh, refugees' problems. So they talk about shelter, food, uh, and those water and those things. They are important. Of course they are important to survive and to live. But I think personally that education should be in the category of water, shelter, and food. It is as important as food is, and I'll tell you why. Because we have seen a generation lost in Afghanistan. When Afghanistan, there was a proxy war between uh, Soviet Union and America, 
and that war was fought on our land and our youth were used as uh, 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 footmen soldiers and this is the 1980s conflict yeah i yeah. mean 1979 and later on yeah for 10 years it went on till soviet union disintegration um, and millions of Afghan children who migrated to Pakistan, uh, they did not get education. Uh, rather, uh, Jan Zeb will tell about it, but they were indoctrinated, few who were sent to schools, they were indoctrinated and radicalized to, be, uh, to love war and to be jihadi. Um, so the big, the big population of the the, the Afghan children remained without education. And now we see that those children who grow up, they are now young men and remaining without education, they are a generation lost. They have gone to the mountains and they are isolated from the mainstream society and now they believe in fighting and getting power uh, through wars uh, and they don't believe in the constitution of Afghanistan. They don't believe in democracy because the way they were indoctrinated or they remained without education, that has taught them the way of violence. So we, when we talk of education, we say that, okay, it's very important uh, that we must provide all basic facilities to Syrian refugees' children to survive, but they should get the education in their camps or wherever they are. Because if a child, child remains without education for three years, four years, education is something that it has a particular specific time. When you lose that time, so you lose your academic career. So that's why these children, I mean the future of Syria depends on its children. And the future of children depends on education. And if the world leaders the developed countries and the developing countries, if they don't come together and they don't fund the education of the Syrian children, God forbid, one day they will also be a generation lost. And we don't want to have a generation lost in Syria because they will go back and if they have the skill, they will rebuild their country. I remember that when Taliban banned girls' education in Swat Valley, and I was the principal and head teacher of my school. And there was very much fear in children and in the community. And uh, most, I mean, some of the boys, and especially girls, they uh, even when Taliban uh, publicly announced on their, on their FM radio that no girl will go to school, otherwise they will face the music. So there was a big uh, dropout I mean, children, but what I did, every day in the morning assembly, I used to tell to the girls and boys that I know we are in a very hard situation. I know it is very difficult while you are worried about your life and you think of education. But it's very important, girls, I used to tell them. Because whatever happens to you, if you are displaced, if you migrate, the only thing that will help you that you can carry with yourself exactly. is your education. That's and a lot to is. ask of a 12 yeah, year old sorry. to stand up to, to the threat of violence every day just by virtue of coming to school. As they're sitting there listening to that, that pep talk from you, how many of them said, okay, principal, I, I, I see that, but there's a man with a gun out there who's gonna shoot me if I come to learn chemistry, I have to stay home. And how many of them, how many of them stood up and said, no, I, I'll keep coming to school? You will believe it or not, our girls were so brave and they got so inspired because when the leader stands, the people stand. So I think I was a small leader of my school and I was fighting on every front for their cause of education, for the right of education. And every girl, and you will astonish one day, a girl came late to school. And as usually principals ask, that why are you late? In a very uh, that mood, huh? very, very, very hard mood. Why are you late? I remember it well. And she told me that uh, I'm late because my father and my brother did not want me to come to school. And when they went out for their work, I stiltily came to school. 
That's like the best student ever who sneaks yeah, out to yeah, go to school. Yeah, but, but, and I'll tell you that when Taliban just snaked this right of education from girls especially, they realized that, yes, yes, this must be important because the bad guys are stopping us. <laughs> so they realized the value of education. And girls, I mean, they stood like rock, not only one mama Malala. Every girl yeah. in that valley was like Malala. That's a potent opponent for the Taliban to stand up to. And you've got yeah. thousands of, of little Malalas saying, no, we're going to get an education. Yeah, of course. It's fantastic. So uh, a nuts and bolts question. How do you get that education into those camps, right? Well, you've got all of these organizations trying to get food, trying to get water. What is it that you guys are doing to try to get, uh, to try to get that in education in there? Because I know you're very passionate about this. I mean, this is... Uh Everybody's responsibility, right from UN to the developed countries in the global north and to the countries in the global south as well. They should not be always taker. They should give as well. As, the, as I'm honorary chair of the Global Peace Center Canada, I'm also the chair of Malala Fund, uh, which is an organization working for uh, girls' education. And our uh, top most priority, our focus is on uh, refugees education, and especially nowadays we are focusing on the education of Syrian refugees, girls and boys both. And I must tell you that the fund has projects uh, in Zatri camp, in Azra camp, and Jordan, uh, where there are uh, hundreds and thousands of Syrian children. And on 18th birthday of Malala, uh, she went to Lebanon, and she, uh, the fund had constructed, uh, constructed a school in Beka Valley uh, for uh, 200 girls, uh, a secondary school. Uh, and now we are making one more school there. So I think the Malala Fund will be educating some more than 400 girls in the Beka Valley, the Syrian girls. Uh, also, the fund is highlighting 12 years of education. Uh, for uh, the girls, uh, whether they are in Nigeria or in Syria. I also mention, I should mention that uh, more than, uh, I mean, around about 30 girls are given scholarship by the fund uh, who got free from the uh, imprisonment of Boko Haram. Yeah. Uh, so this is the work the fund is doing, but we also highlight 12 years of education because when uh, world leaders, they come together, because the world is led by the uh, global North, not by the South. They decide. They decide the values. They this decide the priorities. What should be done first? So by global North, you mean by the Europe, global North, North America. Europe, America? Uh, you people yeah. do all these things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so when they come together and they talk about education, so you unfortunately it's not their top priority. Number one. Uh, number two, when they talk about education, they say, okay, basic education and primary education, education is enough uh, for the children in the developing countries. Uh, but we say no. Because the primary education, this is important, you can't have secondary education without primary education, but secondary education is an education that, uh, that uh, unlocks the potential of the girls and boys and it gives them a wing to fly. So if we want to have a women leadership in our communities, we must give secondary education to our girls. And the Malala Fund uh, has been successful in changing the language of global partnership for education. They have uh, now made uh, 12 years of free and quality education compulsory. The Norwegian government and many other governments, I, I think, in future, uh, they will agree with us in principle that 12, 12 years of education should be uh, compulsory, f uh, free quality education. Fantastic. Sorry. Free, free, I, I want to add Sorry. few things to what Ziauddin said was, Malala Fund is doing huge uh, work in, in her own Swat Valley, Pakistan. Of course. Uh, and there is, in her own, where, where Turpikai was born, Malala was not born there. She was born in Swat, but in Shangla, in Swat Valley, uh, Malala Fund, Malala Ziauddin are doing huge amount of work and to provide their quality education. But one thing which I want to add to what Ziauddin said is, 
Is it only civil society or United Nations responsibility? Is it only uh, our government's responsibility? Uh, yes, civil society is playing a big role. United Nations and NGOs and uh, governments are playing role, but businesses needs to be at par, working in hand in hand with, with government. It is like a stool, a three-legged stool. If only government is working, uh, the stool is imbalanced. If uh, only uh, civil society is working, still the, the stool is Im imbalanced. If, but when go businesses comes, so this stool becomes balanced and our society becomes balanced. So I think we need the, the Education Malala Fund, Global Peace Center, Canada, and all civil society organization. And civil society organization, what do me, I mean from that is academia, universities, schools, colleges, comes part, play a big role into, the, into that. Uh, equation. So it takes multiple. Like you're not gonna you're not gonna solve this it, all by it yourself. It is not only the government responsibility. It is not only um, civil society responsibility. Everyone needs to be playing that uh, hand in hand role into. Excellent. I think we have a question from Tab. Uh, first of all, shukriya apka apya hai hamar office baat karne hamse. My questions regarding your what your point right there um, about the role of the Pakistani government in uh, promoting education. From a government that spends most of its budget, uh, its budget on military, um, how receptive have they been to your message? And what are the challenges you've faced uh, talking to the government that's probably least focused on education in the world? How do you go to them and get them to buy into your yeah. message and start not spending money on military, but also on education? Yeah, I, I, I want to respond quickly. And I, I know Ziauddin will respond in a very thoughtful way. But I was in Pakistan, as I mentioned, uh, we took a delegation from U Waterloo and Lahore University and government uh, information minister, mm -hmm. uh, federal government information minister, I heard him and they, they were uh, made accountable in front of few thousand people in one of the peace uh, and social sciences summit, summit that you said that we are going to allocate uh, a huge amount of GDP to, to uh, education. So they didn't, but they recognized in front of people that we are in a war-like situation. We are in violent conflict. Yes, we, uh, when this situation, we overcome that, we are going to allocate money. So they're uh, saying, we're going to wait until all the war is yeah, over. Well, we'll we'll one thing, and the provincial education has become now a provincial subject. And it is becoming one of the priority. Now, what, is you, what, we are, what we will be doing uh, through different organizations, through different universities, developing peace education curriculum, and provide training in, in, in the concepts of peace or quality education, then government is willing to adopt that nationally or uh, local, uh, locally. So I have trust in them, and only one, like teachers and students can do that, not necessarily, unless government and businesses come on board. Excellent. Vera? I just had a question about what role technology has in solving some of these educational problems. If you can't reach people in person, what can technology do to help you reach people remotely? I will. So for those of you, I don't think that mic is on. For those of you who are watching, the question was, uh, what can technology do to help bring education to people in conflict zones? Is there anyone to respond? Okay, uh, but anyway, I will still ask Yaudin to respond because his answers are uh, excellent always. Uh, we, we are working with University of Waterloo, Law University, so we have, we have developed some e-learning, some online, online education tool, and I think technology provides those platform. And we would like Google to be supporting some of those platforms, uh, partnering with, of course, Global Peace Center Canada, but partnering with the Malala Fund as well to be providing support to young children and adults as well. We, need, we also need to educate ad, uh, older adults to, to unlearn some of their behaviors and learn some new things. So I, I, I think uh, technology is, needs to be playing a huge part, and education needs to be accessible to everyone. And I think we were told that 
um, uh, in Pakistan that we need to have access to journals, we need to have access to books, which is very costly. And I think if uh, technology, if Google, if other technology leaders, if they partner with universities, we can provide that education, those tools to people and they can educate themselves. Another thing is, which is very important, uh, Western government are not issuing visas most of the time. So I think technology can give education people at their doorstep. So technology is a window to resources yeah. that you will never be able to fund. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think technology has hugely transformed education in every part of the world. Uh, once education, uh, I mean, when technology was not on this scale, uh, you will astonish that all these social media channels, I mean, like uh, Google and many other, they are available in the village of, in the village, in the same village where uh, girls were not going to school, when the boys were not going to school, they, now they have computers, they have iPads, they have iPhones, and they have access to this flood of information. Uh, and that's why we have virtual uh, universities, online uh, 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 teaching. Uh, uh, so this is a huge uh, transformation and uh, information technology has made uh, modern education and knowledge as a common asset of the human being for every part of the world. No and longer locked in certain institutions. Yeah, nobody can lock. I mean, it's, it's, it's for everybody. It's for everyone, uh, irrespective of... Uh, uh, it's very secular. Google, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's beyond gender, color, faith. It's available to everybody. And I find sometimes problem uh, with this information technology as a father, when my son is busy on computer. So when we think of computer, my age people, we think that there must be some playing games and that's it. Uh, about right. computer, because I'm of the older generation, I didn't use a computer in my whole life uh, as a student. Right. Later on, now I'm using, but uh, till my master, I never did any assignment, nothing on computer. But my younger son in Birmingham, when I see him busy at his desk on computer, and sometimes say, Atal, you are not doing homework. Because for me, homework means having notebooks and writing something and reading something. He tells me, Abba, I'm doing homework on computer. I can't believe him. <laughs> so, I mean, this is a big uh, change. If he's and doing it on his Xbox, he's probably lying. Yeah. <laughs> also, you see, this modern technology has given a platform of uh, change to uh, people. Uh, like uh, many people in our community, where girls uh, are not supposed to go out in the markets and they're not supposed uh, sometimes, even they're not sent to school. Uh, but I see on social media, the pictures of girls who share their views, uh, are their pictures, their mother pictures. So this change is also coming gradually. Uh, so uh, we are very optimistic, but uh, I must uh, uh, support Jan's, Zeb Khan's idea that, uh, uh, I mean, this huge uh, technology and its organizations, uh, if, they, if they include in their business uh, like a mission or to educate uh, boys and especially girls, I think they can contribute in a way which no other revolution can come uh, uh, can do. So the way they have revolution, uh, revolutionized the world through modern technology, if they focus how to reach to every girl and boy in the world, I think they can do it. But it just needs a commitment, uh, and you are very rich in ideas. There you have it. I mean, that's so. It's it's on us basically. It's we have the tools. If we can make that part of our mission to educate, yes, exactly. we can provide that window into all of human knowledge exactly. for those people. Fantastic. Well, I think we are we out of time, Vera. Or do we have? Yeah, we we can take few. Uh, if they have questions, yeah, if they are tired. Yeah, then we should yeah, wind up you. because we talk too much. Arif. Yeah. All right. But we are enjoying this conversation, so. Is this on, Adam? 
It appears okay. to be on, yeah. Um, this is a bit more of a personal question, but I'm interested in knowing, um, you know, obviously your lives have completely changed um, since this incident. And I'd love to know, what's one cherished memory that is just, you know, beyond your wildest dream that's happened? And is there anything you miss from, you, from your life before? What is he saying? Uh, yeah. uh, is there anything that you miss that from, from your life before when you were in SWAT, before everything changed, after Malala got shot and what everything changed? What I miss now changed? of that life. Pardon? What I miss yeah, now. what do you yeah. miss? Yeah, there are many things. I tell people that every night in my dreams, I'm in SWAT. I'm in Pakistan. Uh, and uh, I'm very engaged with my people on phone and on Skype. I'm in contact with them. Also, the most important thing of my life, which I had there, my role as a teacher. And I do miss children sitting in the classroom when I used to enter, the way they used to welcome me, and the way we used to share ideas with each other. Because my, as a teacher, my class used to be very open, like with open discussion. Because I never told the children that I am the one who will teach you and who has every kind of knowledge. I used to tell them that let's share things. Let's share knowledge and or experiences. And when I used to see the light, sharing an idea, a motivation and some inspirational thing with children. And when I used to see the light on the faces of the children, then I used to tell to myself that Zauddin, you are the most blessed person as a teacher on this earth. So I do miss my children. That's I fantastic. do miss myself as a teacher in Swat Valley. Great. Any other questions? No? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, 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 just one thing which I want from you, I think we provide some solution. We don't, we cannot provide all solution, but we provide some solutions uh, to, to children, to educators, uh, to be having some quality education. And we cannot do that only by ourselves. We need all of you uh, here, which is sitting in this room, as well as your, your colleagues uh, all over the world. So we need your support, and please support this, this good cause today. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you very much for listening to us. Thank you. Thanks so much.